This is episode three of In the Know, presented by Alpine Pursuit, more than just an apparel company. 5% of all sales donated to the BC Wildlife Federation. On this week's episode, I'm going to talk about the recent closure of Bighorn General Open Season in Region 4, and I'm going to try to shed some light on how the province is mismanaging your license dollars. This one might get me a little bit heated. Stay tuned. All right, episode three. Thanks to uh, everybody that's tuned in. If I sound a little bit different, that's because Ty hooked me up with uh, a skookum little uh, microphone to plug into my phone here. So hopefully I sound a little bit better. Um, yeah, so this week I'm going to talk about the recent closure of the Bighorn General Open Season in the Kootenays. Um, for those that listened last week, um, I talked about the hunting and trapping synopsis for the new regulation period and the changes that they introduced. So this is something uh, that was initially brought to light back in, I think it was September 2021, might have been a little bit earlier than that. Um, but nevertheless, we're coming up on a year ago. Uh, we This was brought to light when the Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development, or as you may have heard them referred to as Flinro, we will call them Flinro for the rest of this podcast. Uh, they released their management plan for the region for bighorn populations. And yeah, it's no secret that the bighorn populations in region four have been declining for probably decades now. Um, this management plan that uh, they released back in 2021, as you'd expect, uh, does very little to address things such as habitat fragmentation, disease among wild sheep, populations, uh, and predation. I guess it, sh- it should be noted that cougar harvest remains high in Region 4, um, and this predator reduction has been applauded by Wild Sheep Society BC and the BC Wildlife Federation. Um, so predator management isn't as big as the, the first two there, but it's, it is still a contributing factor for sure. Uh, the Flinro's very own management plan actually stated that they believe the primary causes for the decline in wild sheep are habitat loss, disease, and predation. Yet, their go-to strategy for mitigating this decline is primarily focused around the reduction of hunter harvest. The Bighorn Management Plan also suggested eight alternative strategies to avoid the complete closure of general open season. Um, However, the ministry ultimately, I guess, decided against these. Uh, Some... (laughs) Now, don't quote me on these exactly, but some of the uh, alternative strategies that they had uh, suggested, I believe one of them was a shorter general open season. Um, I think one of them had to do with switching to the taking of mature rams only, which would force hunters to harvest higher age class rams thus reducing the number of rams taken, I guess, in uh, a given season. I know one of the suggestions was the possibility of reducing the time frame for compulsory inspections to 24 to 48 hours, thus affording them the ability to track harvest numbers in, I guess, quote unquote, real time. And then... This would give them the ability to close the season once the harvest threshold had been met. Um, I think another alternative was switching more vulnerable management units, population management management units to LEH and maintaining general open season um, in the PMUs with healthier herds. Um, just to name a few, I can't remember what they all were, but nonetheless, there was eight of them that they suggested, which would have avoided a complete closure of general open season. Uh, and I'm not saying that these strategies would have been the be all end all. 
Um, they all come with their downsides for sure. Um, however, considering the that uh, Flynn Rowe has specifically told us hunter harvest is not the primary cause of the population decline, would it not make sense if changes are needed to gradually adjust hunter harvest and focus the majority of your efforts on things that we know are the primary causes and, and things that we know will actually make a difference to, uh, to help recover these populations. Um, early on in this issue, the BC Wildlife Federation brought in their resident sheep expert, and I hope I don't mess this guy's name up, but uh, his name's Dr. Marco Festa Biancet. He is a leading expert uh, in bighorn sheep. He spent decades studying them. And they basically brought him in and asked him to study harvest data in BC, compare that to the populations. And what he came up with was basically that uh, harvest rates were not at a level that would be expected to cause a decline in populations. Dr. Festa Bianca also concluded that the age of harvest in BC was good and Actually, surprisingly enough, BC is doing a better job on this front than Alberta is. Um, he found no obvious decline in horn growth as a result of hunter harvest, contrary to what the province had initially suggested. The province is claiming the opposite. They state that sheep hunting in Region 4 is not sustainable. Um, they say that it's having a negative genetic impact on the population, mainly as a result of hunters harvesting younger rams with faster growing horns, which they claim is resulting in the absence of six to seven year olds in the herds. Um, it should be noted that the province does not have any type of expert on sheep or sheep scientists. Um, so not only is the province contradicting the opinion of a sheep expert, they're also contradicting their own Flinrow Bighorn Management Plan, which, like I mentioned earlier, states that the primary causes of the population decline is the loss of habitat, disease, and predation. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, not surprising, but frustrating nonetheless. Um, I'm the first one, like... I would say like the majority of uh, outdoorsmen in BC, I'm the first one to support the reduction of hunter harvest for populations that are struggling due to over harvest. Um, however, as we know, this is not the case here. Uh, I, along with many other resident hunters, expect the ministry to focus efforts where it counts and not take the easy way out, which is what this comes across as, in my opinion. Um, Habitat restoration and protection, studies on disease control, keeping domestic sheep separated from wild sheep, continuing to deal with predation. All these things, they're complex issues. They require time. They require money. Um, however, changing hunting regulations doesn't. It's an easy fix in this instance when you go to a complete closure of general open season. When you start looking at the alternatives that they suggested, um, managing things uh, by MU a little bit more, I guess, closely um, or, or uh, closing the season once you hit that threshold, this stuff would cost money to facilitate. Uh, you'd have to, you'd have to obviously employ people to keep track of all this stuff. <laughs> However, that, that that's not the option that they, that they went with. So it's really not really applicable in this instance. Um, they took a complete closure and switched everything to LEH, which is an easy fix. Uh, or in this case, it's an easy thing to create the illusion of a fix because it's not going to fix it. So what happens when you completely eliminate general open season for a given species? Well, now you have an influx of hunters seeking general open seasons elsewhere in the province for different species. So um, 
and in this instance, approximately 300 sheep hunters. That likely means for those 300 sheep hunters, uh, that likely means they're going to be chasing stone sheep, which is a scary thought. Uh, Dr. Festa Bianca has already identified early warning signs of hunter harvest impacting stone sheep populations in the Peace region. And I mean, now we can obviously expect those pressures to rise this year. What happens when the ministry sees an influx in stones being harvested? Um, along with early signs of hunter harvest impacting the population, like I had mentioned, uh, you and I can both take a pretty good guess at how the ministry is going to handle that. Now, none of this stuff is new news. In fact, like I mentioned, this was first picked up nearly a year ago, well before all the 7B stuff uh, came to light. And it seemed to me that once the 7B stuff came to light, everyone kind of shifted their focus on that. And the bighorn changes a little bit kind of fell by the wayside. Um, although I mean, Wild Sheep Society of BC, BC Wildlife Federation, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, they did a phenomenal job throughout on uh, keeping, trying to keep this at the forefront, um, pound out information on this issue, telling people how they could get, uh, get involved, how they could oppose these changes, contact MLAs, emails, phone calls, all that stuff. Um, the tools were all at our disposal as resident hunters. Uh, however, much like the 7B changes, there's an extremely underwhelming amount of action from resident hunters in BC. And now, much like the 7B changes, we are left with one less general open season in the province. Obviously, at this point, we're not going to change the regs. The regs are done. They're out. However, that doesn't mean that us as resident hunters can't put pressure on our local MPs and push for science-based wildlife management increase funding for habitat restoration, disease control, and just our wildlife in general. Um, you don't need something crappy to be happening to, to send a letter to an MP or to make a phone call or email or whatever. Um, you don't have to wait until they come out with uh, a major change like this that you don't agree with. So in terms of, you know, putting pressure on, on the government to uh, invest in our wildlife, I want to pull a few, a few numbers that are likely going to frustrate you as much as they frustrate me. Um, so as of 2017, the, the, Provincial expenditure for the Fish and Wildlife Branch was a whopping decimal 0.6% of the provincial budget. That's correct. Less than 1%. 0.06. The, provin the province is, is literally spending pennies on fish and wildlife in BC. And even still... They will not allow for more than 20% of our license fees to go towards conservation. That 20% goes to the Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation, as some of you are likely aware, uh, who then divvies this up between government projects, essentially, that we have zero say in. Um, when the government biologists who actually give a damn about our wildlife want to put work into a certain issue... They can't just go and, and do it. They have to then apply to the Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation uh, to, and cross their fingers that their project is worthy of using up a portion of that measly 20%. So for those that don't know, that's basically how, how it works in BC. Um, I, I would love to get into this a little bit deeper on a future episode. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty depressing when you start comparing BC to uh, different states um, and the, the amount of 
money that some of the states put into wildlife management compared to BC is is just downright embarrassing. But I would love to I'd love to dive into that on a future episode a little bit more thoroughly. Um, we have to realize as resident hunters that the closure of one general open season impacts other wildlife around the province. Like I mentioned regarding the stone sheep, uh, it's not just stones that get affected by this. Um, as hunters shift their focus to harvesting other species in, in other areas, just because you don't necessarily hunt bighorns in the Kootenays doesn't mean this change doesn't affect you as a goat hunter in region six or a road hunter in region two. Um, the province's reluctance to address the actual issues with wildlife management and the trending closure of general open seasons as a management tool is a snowball effect. And we were only at the beginning of that snowball. It doesn't matter. Like I said, it doesn't matter if you're going out bombing roads in region two on the weekends get your annual spike or blacktail and maybe a bear and call it a season with some meat in the freezer. These closures directly affect you. You just might not realize it yet. Um, You know, you, you close, you close one general open season, all those hunters move elsewhere. They put pressure on, on that population. They close that the next regulation period. So now you have twice or triple the amount of people they move elsewhere. They're putting triple the amount of pressure on other areas in the province. Like I said, it's just a snowball effect. Um, All this when we could have just addressed the actual problem, habitat restoration and protection, disease control, predation, actually investing in the wildlife in this province. It doesn't help our cause when groups like Wild Chief Society BC, BCWF, BHA call for people to step up and contribute to the fight. And we see... 5% 5% of resident hunters actually sign the petitions, send the letters, make the phone calls. It's depressing to say the least. Um, rest assured though, that after public comment period is closed and the regs have been put into effect, you'll see 90% of the resident hunters complain about the changes. Um, I do believe that we're improving as resident hunters. Um, I will say, I think there's an increasing amount of hunters that are, uh, active on social media and therefore better informed by conservation groups. Perhaps as the younger generations get more involved, we'll see improvements on the mobilization of campaigns and petitions. Uh, one can only hope anyway. Uh, anyway, I should probably try to reel this thing back in a little bit because I can feel my blood pressure rising uh, as I speak here. So... In closing, I would like to shed light on two more things um, regarding one of them anyway, regarding the absolute joke that is our wildlife funding system. Uh, There was recently an MLA that tabled the Wildlife Amendment Act, um, which is a private member's bill that would lay the groundwork for new independent funding model for wildlife and habitat management. MLA Tom Shipitka, I think I'm saying that correctly, introduced an act that would essentially ensure that 100% of the revenue from licenses as well as fees from hunting and other forms of land use, such as stakeholder, philanthropy, industrial usage, would all go towards funding wildlife and habitat management. Um, seems too good to be true. (laughs) This bill would also supposedly support science-based decision-making. So, yeah, I mean, at first glance, at first glance, this, this looks like uh, a pretty incredible, a pretty incredible bill. However, this is not the first time bill, a bill like this has been tabled. And so far all have been unsuccessful. The provincial government is not willing to forfeit the 80% of our license fees that is currently feeding into the general fund in BC. So uh, this is something that we as hunters and anglers need to get behind if we want to have a hunting heritage to pass down to future generations, in my opinion. So 
Uh, lastly, I want to encourage every single listener to hit the link in the show notes and sign the petition to stop the shadow registry order in Canada. It's a House of Commons petition open for signatures until August 10th. It takes approximately 30 seconds to sign. You'll get uh, an email to confirm your identity, which takes a minute or two to get into your inbox. You hit the link and you're done. So it's uh, it's pretty simple. And you know, the more signatures we can get on there, the better. So, um, yeah, do your part. Sign it. Anyway, that's my time for this week. 